All right, you guys, it's been a few days now. Hopefully everyone who's wanted to see House of the Dragon episode one has had the opportunity to do so. We're going to do a full episode one breakdown review, spoiler filled, of course. So if you haven't seen it, you've been warned, this video will contain spoilers. Now, my initial impression of this episode, while it wasn't negative, it wasn't as positive as it is today. I've seen it a few more times and I've been able to formulate a more informed opinion of episode one. Hopefully I do a good job at communicating to you guys what exactly has changed for me and why I see it a little bit differently than I did when it first premiered. Hope you guys enjoy the video. If you do, make sure you leave it a like. If you're new here, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on more House of the Dragon content coming up very soon. Without further ado, let's get into this. So the series starts off with a great council meeting to determine Jaehaerys Targaryen's heir. Now, I stated in my spoiler-free review that I was not a fan of this opening, but I want to elaborate. What worried me about this opening is how it would hit for a general audience unfamiliar with the source material. Whereas book readers, we may know exactly what this council meeting is and the significance and history behind it, but is it the most interesting way to open the series to those unfamiliar with the books? My initial thought was, no, this is not a great opening compared to The White Walkers Beyond the Wall and Game of Thrones. However, people actually don't seem very critical of this opening, and I'm not here to tell general audiences how they should feel. So to be clear, I'm a fan of this world and I want House of the Dragon to be good, but I also understand the importance of it appealing to a broader audience to be successful. If it's critically acclaimed but only book readers want to watch it, that could be problematic. So now we're going to transition to young Rhaenyra flying through the clouds with some real glowy dreamlike imagery, which is a significant transition and contrast to the gloom of Harrenhal and the Great Council. Kind of CGI heavy here, and that's okay, but I was not impressed at all with the dragon's look in the first episode, and after a few viewings, I'm still not impressed. They definitely have more distinguished features, but so far I actually think Game of Thrones has them beat here. And that's troubling because there's not a good excuse for that. You can overcome bad CGI with good story, but you can't overcome bad story with good CGI. I mean, look at Game of Thrones last couple seasons. So we'll see how this goes, but that's something I'm going to keep an eye on, especially as more dragons are introduced and as they're also more introduced into action sequences. Now we move on to Rhaenyra and her mother, Emma. This is a good small scene that will carry some weight and be visually referenced in the second act of this episode, and in the best sequence I think the episode has to offer. Now, Emma educates Rhaenyra on the significance of their royal wounds. The line, quote, this discomfort is how we serve the realm, end quote. And she follows that up with another quote, a child bed is our battlefield, end quote. I like this for two reasons displays a dash of defiance for Rhaenyra, but also establishes the expectation of women, but more importantly, royal women slash noble women. The observation of the patriarchy is something we've seen in A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones, but this particular story is centered around this uncomfortable conversation in a more substantial way, and this seed planting for the rules of this world I think we'll remember once the actual Dance of the Dragons begins. Next we get to see our first council meeting and really our first impression of a couple characters. Now Viserys opens the scene telling some joke that everyone laughs at, but it, there's a much more mild temperament to Viserys than any ruler we've really seen in this world. And I think it says a lot to show him initially perceived by the rest of the main characters or the rest of the small council meeting. He's somebody that I think others feel they can easily manipulate. And Daemon will point this out later. Now, Corlys makes his first comments of the series stressing the importance of addressing the issue with the triarchy led by the Crab Feeder. Essentially, they've driven out the pirates on the Stepstones and have established a dominion that ultimately will cause significant tolls to someone like Corlys Velaryon. But this is quickly dismissed by Viserys and Otto Hightower. It's small things like that that will play a more of a significance later in this season and will help establish a connection with Corlys and Daemon as they both engage with the Stepstone situation. Now, I don't want to spoil too much more than that. I'll just say, remember this moment. One thing I really want to compliment this first episode on is that most scenes are of some consequence. 
Now there's going to be a huge scene that comes up here at the end of this episode that I think I may have changed my mind on from my initial review, and I think it might be a better ending to this episode than I had previously thought. So two last things in this scene that I thought was interesting was hearing Lyman Beesbury, who is currently the Master of Coin, questioning the absence of Daemon, who is commander of the City Watch. You see, they've invested into Daemon's new approach to the City Watch, but have been given little reports of progress, and Daemon skips out on the council meetings. But what's to take note of is how quickly his brother, King Viserys, defends his absence, assuming he's busy fulfilling those obligations. And then last thing here, the balls or marbles that you see each council member place in their plates, while may lend to some more subtle visual commentary or symbolism, the show creators have actually come out and clarified that these are practically utilized the same as a time card or a punch card. When they place the ball in the plate, they've clocked in and are present. Interestingly enough, the black ball in the middle belongs to none other than Daemon Targaryen. And that's going to be a good segue for us to go into our next scene. So Rhaenyra enters the throne room to find Daemon sitting on the Iron Throne. Immediately, you'll take note of Rhaenyra and Daemon speaking in High Valerian. I think this is an effective way to establish their bond fairly early on, but to further that point, Daemon gifts Rhaenyra a necklace made with Valerian steel. Now rather than the intangible language they both share, now they have a physical symbol to represent their connection. She has the necklace, and he has the Valerian sword, Dark Sister. The next scene, I'm kind of cold about because I don't think it really establishes much for this particular episode. It may set up something for later and it'll be interesting to look back on. So next we see Rhaenyra and Alicent as they study their history. It's kind of a cute little moment, but also shares Rhaenyra's desire to live her life next to her best friend flying over the narrow sea to journey east and see the world. I think we'll look back on this kind of in a peculiar way when we realize what her aspirations were versus what they become later. We next get a scene that may or may not have significant consequence. Viserys has a sore on his back. Now, at first you may think this is some sort of foreshadowing about a potential health issue that you would ultimately find killing Viserys. Well, not so fast there. I don't want to spoil the book or this story, but I think this will be more aligned with a different message that may be more connected to legend or myth that actually has nothing to do with Viserys' well-being or health. And I'll dive into that a little bit more here in a second, because next we get to see Viserys visit with his queen, Emma. Now, if you saw trailers, you're going to recognize this, and I don't think this is nothing. He shares with his queen, that voiceover we heard from the trailer, his dream that she is carrying his son, and not only that, but this son is born with Aegon's Iron Crown. Now, we know the fate of Emma and ultimately the fate of Balon, the baby. So this dream doesn't come true here, but that doesn't mean that it won't. He's just got the wrong woman and child for this dream. But I think the statement he was born with Aegon's Iron Crown is not something to forget moving forward. So now, Emma reasserts that it's her duty to provide Viserys with an heir. Sure. But it's also something that the realm expects from their king or maybe even the gods. I'm going to draw a quick parallel here, but let me know what you think in the comments because maybe this is going to come across as crazy. Now, if you're familiar with Megor the Cruel, one of the things that seemed to curse him was his inability to produce a male heir. Now, depending on how you interpreted this, Megor was anything but weak, but not being able to produce his heir seemed to destroy him. They called him cursed. And ultimately, he died on the Iron Throne with plenty of mystery surrounding his death. But he was impaled by one of the swords welded to the throne. He was cursed, he couldn't create a son, and was killed by the Iron Throne. When we observe Viserys now visibly being harmed by the throne, it makes you wonder if the throne itself can outright harm those who do not belong or have proven themselves unworthy. If Viserys can't produce his heir, could he be doomed to the same fate as Magor? We all should know that ultimately Viserys does produce sons, but these injuries are interesting. Let me know what you guys think about the possibility of the throne itself rejecting the king. Now finally though, we get to some action. Now I love this moment, it felt slow to me leading up to this point for the episode, 
But we last saw Daemon being this sweet uncle character who has this connection with Rhaenyra that seems genuine enough, and then it just gets very vicious from here. He's got his city watched together, and they are rounding up all the criminals and unleashing truly brutal justice. I mean, this is actually gross at times, but what are they trying to communicate? I think they want us totally baffled by Daemon. Is he totally mad? Violence for the sport of it? He's ruthless and seems to enjoy harming people. Now, starting him out here makes his arc as a character pretty interesting, as his motives are definitely questionable. Now, Daemon is brought in to answer for his actions. Most notably, he's criticized by Otto Hightower, and yet he's supported by Corlys Velaryon. This is a good scene for displaying some early rivalry between Otto and Daemon, but at this time also, you could say that the two most powerful houses outside of the Targaryens are the Velaryons and the Hightowers, and this is the second time we've seen a bit of divide between these two houses. Viserys seems to take the middle ground here, approving of the concept of criminals fearing the city watch, while loosely condemning the manner in which Daemon has chosen to do this. Otto criticizes Daemon's lack of devotion to his wife. Now, Daemon strikes back. He jokingly offers Rhea Royce to Otto with an insult about Otto's wife who has passed away recently. It's clear Daemon has no interest in his marriage to Rhea Royce, but more, I think this illustrates Otto's faith to the Seven and his more traditionalism that he carries with him in his values as he's at court. We next see Daemon with Masaria, and I'm going to be a little critical here. This isn't the most tasteful way to introduce this character. It establishes that she is a prostitute maybe, but that's it. Daemon has some struggles performing, I guess, because he's stressed that Viserys may rid him from court. I don't know. Masaria is introduced here, but she's not named or addressed by her name at all. I think this was a bad scene actually. If you disagree and saw something more revealing here, let me know in the comment section. But Masaria plays a role in this story. So I could have used a little more there. Something that says that she's something of significance. Anything, really. So that that's that there. Now, the tournament for the air is to be held. And this is a true visual presentation and really the visual highlight of the episode. The criticism I would have, if you're unaware of these noble houses, it might be a little tricky to keep up. The violence is actually kind of over the top as well, as many of them fight to the death. Yet even Rainey says to Corlys that these are green men inexperienced in war. It definitely seemed to go a little far, and I don't like this because the rules of this world allows a conversation or disagreement to start a war, but the deaths of the men from these noble houses is accepted as kind of the norm. A joust is one thing, but, but hopping off your horse and fighting to the death, I I don't know. That kind of takes me out of it just a little bit. Chris and Cole is the only one who relents when he has Daemon beat, but Daemon was reaching for a dagger to stab Chris and Cole before Chris and Cole stepped on his arm preventing it. So what are the rules here and why do they seem to be so flexible? I do like the continued taunting with Daemon and Otto here at the tournament. Daemon defeating Otto's son and then seeking Alicent Hightower's favor. Kind of a troll move. I'm sure some will have a problem with Kristen Cole being Dornish, but that matters as much to me as Rainey's not having dark hair and I don't care enough to talk about it. Sorry. Now during the tournament, Viserys is informed Emma is having troubles with her labor. And I really enjoy the intercutting of these two scenes. She called the childbearing bed her battlefield and then we see a literal battle between Chris and Cole and Daemon Targaryen. And this scene is really brutal and effective. Viserys as a character gets so many more layers added onto him than what's available in the source material. And Patty Constantine really delivers. But he's given a choice between leaving the fate of Emma and the baby to the gods or a C-section that in these times will absolutely kill her. They did show us Viserys truly caring for Emma so... On the outside, we know that the only thing to do really is to try and save the baby. But this is a difficult choice for him to make because he's actually there. He's much more emotionally connected, but he chooses to try and save the child. Emma shows fear and absolute torment, 
and he stays by her side experiencing this god-awful moment as his wife is killed before him in the process of trying to save the baby. It's hard to watch, and truly, it, it pulled an emotional reaction from me experiencing it, especially the first time. It's really the turning point of the episode. Intercut that with Kristen Cole defeating Daemon, it's a dark day for Targaryens. Kristen hitting Daemon in the back when he's not looking definitely changes the way I viewed this in the source material. I think many saw Cole as a superior fighter maybe based on the books, but that wasn't really the case. I think they were pretty even. Now this next scene is another favorite. Showing the funeral of Emma and then it's revealed that they lost the baby as well. Rhaenyra displaying some resentment toward her father I think is good at showing some growing inner conflict within herself, but really Daemon leaning in and being that voice of reason gives his character an additional layer too. As he suggests that she needs to be there for her father, in the inside of the episode segment at the end of this particular episode, the showrunners revealed that this was actually a Matt Smith idea. So it's good to see one of your actors truly have a finger on the pulse here a bit and understand these moments. I think it's unfortunate that, to our knowledge, the first time Rhaenyra says that famous line, Dracarys, is to light the fire that will burn her mother's body. Next, we see Otto immediately trying to get in front of the situation as he can't accept Daemon being the heir. And again, we see Corlys oppose that view, claiming Daemon is the heir, but it is interesting that for the third time, we see the divide between the Valarians and the Hightowers. Also, Otto supporting the claim of Rhaenyra will be interesting to look back on. What none of them know is that Daemon is spying on them. Now I look at this as something that provokes Daemon's next scene a bit, and we'll get there in just a moment. But again, the way Patty Constantine executes these scenes is great. The first time we saw him at the small council meeting, he was very optimistic. And each meeting has watched him kind of descend away from happiness, and the acting communicates this so well. The next scene with Allison and Otto really gets us some insight into how Otto thinks and really how how he works, how his manipulation on the crown and his agenda, how he tries to implement that. He sends Allison to go comfort the king. He's essentially making his daughter an offer. Now, if you think that's not the case, he makes it more clear when he suggests she wear one of her mother's dresses. One thing I do want to ask you guys though, Allison keeps tearing apart her fingers. They're not showing this for no reason. I'm not sure exactly what it means, but if you have some ideas, please drop them in the comments. I certainly expect this to be meaningful later. Now this is what I was talking about with Daemon. This speech he gives at the pleasure house that Otto shares with Viserys, does he take that spiteful tone if he didn't spy on the small council? If he didn't know that, you know, maybe this small council might conspire against him? I don't know. Did he really call Balon the heir for a day? I'm not sure about that either, but when he meets with the Viserys to answer for this rumor, he does not deny it. But finally, Otto has been successful in convincing Viserys to take action against Aemon. Be mindful that Rhaenyra is there to witness this conversation, and I'm curious to see if she brings this up to Daemon in the future. Now, this back and forth between Viserys and Daemon is beautiful. Matt Smith and Patty Constantine really crank it up a notch. They both display accurately their shared frustration. They both feel hurt and angry with one another. Daemon feels discarded by his brother, and Viserys feels betrayed by Daemon. Now, Daemon calls Viserys weak and says that he can't protect himself from his own small council, and he's right in a way, because the council is trying to serve their own agendas. Ultimately, Daemon is sent to the Vale. Now one last thing, we see Viserys cut himself on the Iron Throne after being called weak. So now he can't produce a son, people think he's weak, and now the Iron Throne is rejecting him. Maybe. I don't know if that's going to be a thing or not, but again, they're not showing him getting cut by the throne for no reason. The way things like this work, each shot costs money. Each shot, you have to justify the budget to make that shot. They do it for a purpose. They're showing us something for a reason. It's too expensive to do it for no reason. Now, that's the end of it for Viserys. He's going to name Rhaenyra heir, and he brings her down in front of Valerian's skull to inform her of this. 
Now, in my initial review after first watching this, I didn't like it. Viserys states that Aegon's conquest was truly about prophecy and protecting the realm from the Long Night or the White Walkers during the Long Winter, calling the dream a song of ice and fire. At first, I was like, this is just fan service and I don't think they'll ever bring this up again. But then I saw the Weeks Ahead trailer and we see Rhaenyra reciting the secret that her father gave her and referencing a song of ice and fire. And I'll say this, combining that information with her being named heir, I thought was kind of a dissatisfying end to the episode and I didn't really love that. But if they keep this prophecy as part of a motive for Rhaenyra, it'll be interesting to see how it influences her in this expanded adaptation. Now, and by the way, we do get to see Caraxes before Daemon leaves. He looks fine, but like Cyrax, I'm not blown away with our first impression there. Hopefully, that's something that improves, maybe not this first season, but if they hear enough criticism about it, maybe they give us a more believable or more practical appearance to these dragons. We also haven't really seen them in action, so... You know, it just might really be the scenery, a specific scene they don't look great in. You never know. Now, I'm excited for this series. I had bigger concerns after my first watch of this episode than I do now. I think with enough time to sit with my thoughts, as well as seeing what fans who were unfamiliar with the source material thought, my optimism is still high. A big concern for me isn't so much whether or not I like it, I love it. I, I, I love it, but I also am grading this on what do I think fans who are unfamiliar with the source material may think, because it's going to be in a big way contingent on their viewership to keep this successful. Now, I'm very excited for this series. I had bigger concerns after my first watch of this episode than I do now. I think with enough time to sit with my thoughts as well as seeing what fans who are unfamiliar with the source material thought, my optimism is still high. For a first episode, this works for me, and I'm glad to see it work for a lot of other people too. It's not perfect, but it doesn't have to be. It just needs to be good enough that viewers who are unfamiliar with the source material will keep watching. If they enjoy it, that makes me happy as a fan of the source material, because then that means I get to keep seeing this show about a book that I'm interested in. I'm not saying Fire and Blood is a good book. It's not. It's... It's not a song of ice and fire. It's not that it's not the main series. It's more of a history book. Nobody's favorite book is a history book. But with that said, if we can keep mainstream fans watching and if they enjoy it and they have a good time with it, and I want them to, then I get what I want as well. So if it's critically successful and it's commercially successful, it's the best of both worlds. And that's what I'm hoping for for this series. Um, so in my last video, Maybe I came across a little bit more uh, pessimistic, and I was because I'm I want this show to work, and I worry about certain things that maybe your average viewer just isn't even thinking about. Guys, look, thank you so much for spending some time with me and listening to me talk about this first episode. I'm looking forward to episode two. If you enjoyed this, please leave it a like. If you made it this far and you're not subscribed, please, I would love to have you. I'd love you to follow this journey with me for House of the Dragon. And until next time. We'll see you.